Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial of our software testing bootcamp. We are talking about the fundamentals of testing. We got started with the chapter one where we are talking about basics of software testing and it's time for us to move ahead with the next topic which is 1.3 principles of testing. So in order to talk about the principles of testing we have seven standard principles of software testing and we will be talking about them in order to understand that how these principles contribute to our overall process of testing and at the same time how exactly this can be implemented in our day-to-day -day activities how these nourish us our work and at the same time what exactly we do the best in order to meet the or adhere to these principles we might be doing all these activities in our day-to-day -day already but we just may not be sure about is there a principle assisting that? Yes, that's what we will be talking about. So we have seven standard principles for testing and they are principle one, testing shows presence of defects. Principle two, exhaustive testing is impossible. Principle three, early testing. Principle four, defect clustering. Principle five, pesticide paradox. Principle six, testing is context dependent. And principle seven, absence of error fallacy. Now, each of these principles has a deep meaning in that and that's where we will be picking up each of them separately to talk about it in detail and we will be having multiple tutorials covering all the seven principles of testing. So let's get started with the first one and look into that. So the very first principle we are having here is called as testing shows presence of defects but not their absence. That means testing is a process where a tester can go on testing the application in order to find the defect. The whole process just justifies one thing, that testing is an activity by which you can find defects. But no matter at any point, whatever number of defects you would have found, it does not justify that you have found all the defects, right? Because say for example, I'm testing an application with 1000 test cases and have been testing this application for one year today. And at this point, can I make a statement that I have found all the defects? No, because testing shows presence of defect. If you go on testing further down the line another six months, you may find some more defects. So testing does not justify or approve that your product is defect free. Testing just is capable of finding defects. If you test anything, you'll find defects, but it does not mean that if you stop testing, you have found all the defects. Or you cannot have a threshold that at this point, if you have found 300 defects in a product, you are done with what you wanted to do. If you continue testing, you would continue finding more defects is what this principle is trying to say. Testing does not justify that a product is defect free. You can never release a defect free product. It's just that you perform the best testing in the given timeline. Let's jump into the next principle and it says exhaustive testing is impossible. Yeah, impossible. A lot of us know that. A lot of our coaches, motivational speakers say that the word impossible consists of I am possible. Of course, exhaustive testing is possible. It's certainly not something which is completely impossible. But let's understand right from the scratch that what exactly exhaustive testing is all about. When it comes to exhaustive testing, it's more about testing a particular scenario with all possible inputs and their desired outputs. In order to test a simple application like or simple page like login, I come up with four combinations of username and password. For example, username is valid, password is valid. Second test would be username valid, password invalid. Third scenario would be username invalid, password valid. And fourth scenario will be invalid username and invalid password. But when you know invalid, you have multiple possibilities of passing the invalid parameters or data, right? Now there could be any number of combination of this in order to test the login. Even if I just take a very approximate number, I would say there would be at least 40 test cases considering various inputs from invalid scenario and coming up with all the permutation and combinations. Now that's the case only for the login, which is lining up creating 40 test cases. You talk about a registration page, which has more number of fields, 
or probably any other application where you have so many other pages, so many other fields to deal with, you may come up with even 4,000 test cases. The point here is, though you land up creating the test cases, the first part is you may not create all possible test cases, first of all. You don't have so much time. Second, even if you land up creating using your manual resource, land up creating all those test cases, does the project allow you to execute 4,000 test cases in a given timeline, which is very restricted for the QA? Answer is no. And as we answer it no together, we understand exhaustive testing is impractical. It's impossible, but I would use the word instead of saying that exhaustive testing is impractical to be conducted. You just can't come up with all possible test cases. Even if you come up with it, you just can't execute it because the time given to you is very limited. So what should we do? The answer is we make use of certain test techniques to reduce our test cases, minimize our test cases, and come up with the best coverage possible with those limited test cases. We'll be talking about this in our upcoming chapters, that what are test techniques and how we can reduce our test cases with help of this in order to meet this principle. Let's talk about the next principle here. The principle number three says, early testing saves time and money. It's a very simple understanding that if you start something early, you not only save time, but you could be aware of certain blockers, certain dependencies much earlier in the life cycle. What's the problem in getting these things at a later point of time? Of course, the amount of rework required in a development life cycle model. You may start with requirement gathering. Using that requirement, you create a design. Then from that design, you start implementation. And then you begin with your dynamic testing. Now, assume that you were doing system testing and you got a defect. And that defect, when reported to developer, developer says, as per my understanding, it is working pretty much fine. So I don't know if this is a defect. So you went together with the developer to the business analyst asking them that, hey, is this what developer has understood is correct or is my understanding correct? The answer is business analyst says that, okay, no, the developer misunderstood it or the architect misunderstood it, or the business analyst, the worst thing what he can say is, I cannot mention all the details. Actually, there are some missing information. The point here is, no matter what the answer is from the business analyst, at this point, you need to refine your requirement, you need to redesign it, you need to re-implement it in order to close this defect. But at the same time, if I say, what if, you and the developer together would have reviewed these requirements when the requirements were being documented. Wouldn't we, 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 wouldn't we have been you know, identifying these type of issues right there? And that's what we call it as early detection or early testing. Early testing saves time and money in sense of finding anomalies, contradictions, omissions, inconsistencies right earlier in the life cycle. The moment this work product is being created, we review it and share our concerns, observations, or ambiguities which we find and report it to the author so that the author can optimize it, update it, and little or maybe no rework is required because it's a requirement gathering phase and we are still busy gathering requirements. So no rework is considered. But if you find the same thing at a later point of time, probably during dynamic testing, you would say, yeah, it requires a lot of rework, repetition of certain activities, thus invites an extra time and cost involved in it. So we also have a great statement to say here that defects which are identified earlier are cheaper to fix than later in the life cycle. And this approach is basically to prevent defects. Early testing prevent defects to happen. You find out those issues right at the beginning. And second, you are doing static testing, which is one type of testing to be performed earlier in the life cycle. Thus, early testing will save your time and money both while working in a development life cycle. Any organization must encourage conducting early testings, organizing static testings or reviews for various work products, be it requirement, design, or development work products, but should be reviewed before they are referred for any further documentation. 
any further references for testing. I hope that makes pretty much sense and that's what we wanted to talk as a part of this tutorial. We'll be coming back with the remaining tutorials on principles of testing in our next one, right? So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.